Hello and welcome to NOV Live. I'm Michael Gaines and glad you are joining us today as we continue our conversation here, bringing you technology and technical experts to field your questions and bring insight into new and innovative technologies helping shape the energy world. So glad you're joining us today. It's gonna to be another great conversation and are looking forward to having you be a part of today's convo. So before we dive in to bring in our guest, as always, we have the pleasure and opportunity to have Shelby Dumain bring us in and let us know uh, how you can be a part and also, uh, of course, feature our Rig Geek segment as well. So uh, certainly something that we always, always enjoy. So for that, we'll go ahead and bring Shelby in. I know, I know she's there somewhere. There, there she is. <laughs> Here All right. Go. I know. I know. There we are. Well, hey, Shelby. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Hey, Michael. It's great to see you as well. And uh, for everyone watching at home, I'm glad that you joined us this morning or, or this afternoon, maybe, depending where you're at. Uh, if you would like to get involved with the show, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Of course, the easiest and fastest way to get involved today, get your questions answered, is to comment in the comment section. I was looking at it briefly when Michael was talking, and I can already see we have um, some, oh, excuse me, some viewers from Scotland, Argentina, I think I saw Brazil, Texas, uh, Sweden. So really thankful for everybody tuning in. Let us know where you're watching from. And then, like I said, if you have a question at any point during the conversation, go ahead and, and comment those below. And we're going to get to as many as we can um, at the end of the discussion with our guest. And then after the show, if you have more questions, if you'd like to get in contact um, with us about maybe an idea that you'd like to see us talk about on the show, or maybe any questions from a past episode, you can do so a couple different ways. Uh, the first is you can email us at socialmedia at nov.com. That uh, email is on screen. You can just send us a quick message there, or you can actually give us a phone call. Uh, so you can call us, leave a voicemail, you can stay anonymous, or if you would like to let us know your name and maybe where you're from or where you work, you can do that as well for a chance to be featured on the show. And that number is country code plus one three four six two two three. 4799. So I look forward to hearing from everybody, um, like either, like I said, either in the comments and our email or our phone call. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that's all the different ways that you can contact us and ask your questions. But now it's uh, my favorite part of the show. It's a time where we ask you a question. So it's time for Rig Geek Post of the Week. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, do that question. So it, some of you, if you follow NOV, you might have noticed we posted an article um, a couple weeks ago, and it was about how Dominion is building a Jones Act compli compliant wind uh, turbine installation vessel. Uh, and we're asking you, all of our rig geeks in the comments, after which Greek mythological sea monster was this vessel named? So if you're if you're if you've brushed up on your Greek mythology recently, you might know. Uh, but go ahead and put your guesses in the comments, and then at the end of the show, we will reveal the answer. So stay tuned to see if you know which uh, Greek mythological sea monster the uh, Dominion uh, wind uh, wind turbine installation vessel is named after. A lot of tongue twisters there. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks, Shelby. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will certainly circle back with you uh, at the end of the show. So for today's conversation, we're actually going to go ahead and jump in and talk about a topic uh, that uh, we've actually done a podcast on, the NOV Today podcast uh, in the past, and have had ser several conversations. But we're talking about uh, wind turbine installation vessels. And uh, for the, the passerby, you might mistake it for uh, potentially a, a, a jack-up drilling rig, but as we'll find out today, um, actually there are many things that are different that set uh, the two apart, and we have the opportunity to talk with an expert today who will not only be able to answer your questions, but also shed some light into this really evolving and innovative space. So uh, we're going to go ahead and bring in our guest today, Alberto Morandi. He is the Houston General Manager for Gusto MSC here at NOV. So Alberto, uh, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever our listeners might be. And very pleased to be here to talk about 
wind turbine installation vessels and looking forward to a good discussion. Great. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, I know that you uh, you have a, a rich background in history uh, in this space, uh, Alberto. And and uh, so I, I know that we can we have the opportunity to jump jump right into some really good ones. And so I'll, I'll start out by uh, maybe talking about some recent uh, recent news and, and articles uh, that uh, talked about uh, new contracts for new build offshore wind installation uh, jack up vessels. Uh, I, I, I know that you so I'm I'm a big LinkedIn guy. I know that you are as well. Um, right. so I've seen that you've been you know liking and posting and, and commenting on some things. So can you talk about uh, you know some of these vessels and maybe give a little background uh, for those that aren't as familiar into the market itself? Yeah, I mean, we are very excited with the activity. You've seen the announcements from the Shimizu vessel last year, also announcements of OHT and, and, and Scorpio, and now more recently, the first Jones Act compliant wind turbine installation vessel to service the US market, you know, the Dominion vessel. And I'm not going to say the name because that's the quick re question. And well, these are really jack up vessels. So they transit from location to location. Once they reach the location, they can jack down their legs and penetrate firmly into the, to the sea floor. And that gives those this type of rig the mobility to move between different uh, sites and install turbines. But also this penetration to the sea floor gives you a firm foundation, which then makes the platform very stable which is very important, particularly when you're installing the rotors and the blades and all the different components of the wind, wind turbine. So that's what's really have made the jackup. And the jackup is a great concept used in drilling, now using in, in offshore wind too, just because of the flexibility and stability it provides. And, and offshore wind in general is very exciting because of all the different energy transition concepts uh, wind is, is, is one of the front, front runners and, and offshore wind is very important in, in that context. It's a market that's happening right now in Europe, here in the United States, in Asia, right? And it's estimated that it could meet the global electricity needs 18 times over. So you can see the mm. size of it, you know, and we might be looking at a trillion dollars of investment in offshore wind by 2040. So globally is a very large market and, and, and offshore wind and wind in general it becomes competitive by the day. You know, the, 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 the cost keeps reducing technological improvement and, and particularly the use of larger and more efficient turbines. So that, that is one of those energy transition applications that is not, it's not the future, it's, re, it's here, it's happening and you will only grow faster, right? Mm -hmm. Now in the US, we have something like 29 gigawatts already committed by the different states to be installed by 2035. And it could be easily be 40 gigawatts by 2040. So that's a lot of turbines to be installed in the coming decades, right? right. And, you know, the, the, this discussion on the Dominion vessel, and it, it comes in the context of the Virginia Clean Economic Act, which is looking to install 5.2 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035 and Dominion Energy itself has a goal to be net zero carbon in all 16 states it's operating right now by 2050. So they also planning to build five gigawatts of US offshore wind. Hmm. So really exciting times. Right, right. And so, you know, I know that the uh, the culmination of these type types of projects is is certainly if you, you can kind of backtrack it to you know particular events and and uh, and, and items so I'm always curious and, and again I really want to lean on your expertise uh, in this industry why why is now the time that it seems like these types of projects are, are coming online and, and really uh, kind of you know making making headlines yeah I mean we see a number of projects that we require installation vessels, let's say by 2024, 2025, right? So there is an ex there, there is a projected shortage in the market for vessels during that time period that can lift those larger turbines that, that are coming to the market. So 2024, yeah, is a couple of years away, but if you need to have those vessels ready to operate by then, you need to start making decisions and you start construction or, or, or upgrades now, right? 
And, and, and another factor is by 2024, we might be seeing a recovery of oil and gas well underway, which is also going to require installation vessels, not exactly the same installation vessels, but also will have an impact. And now, so you see those projects taking off, both in terms of new builds and also upgrading of existing wind turbine installation vessels. And and I'm really pleased that Gusto MSC and NOV in general are succeeding in, in landing both new builds and upgrade contracts. I think mm. I should mention to the, the Cadillac is another recent contract that, that is a crane upgrade, which also we're very excited about. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, and beyond just in, beyond the design and, and cranes, we also, you know, we all, we all, we're there with the owners. Once the vessels are delivered, we are there to provide site assessments. We are there to provide a digital services like our operator support system. You know, we're really there to help the owners get the best of the vessel they are, they're operating. Hmm. So I, I'd love to hear your perspective on really helping folks who may either be familiar with uh, offshore wind installation vessels or, um, you know, what would be considered a, a typical uh, maybe a, a oil and gas drilling jackup. Could you talk about maybe some of the, the differences, uh, maybe either in the design or in, in even operation? Because I, I know that when I first uh, learned about this, I was I was really surprised because I thought, you know, just looking, you know, face value that that one was as similar as, as the other. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are similarities in technology and a lot of differences in functionality. And I think I have a, you can put the slide, yeah. And I hope it's readable. But, you know, I think there are two things that jump on those, right? And here I'm comparing, you know, Augusta MSC CJ70. CJ stands for cantilever jackup. 70 mean is this leg spacing. So this is the largest rig design built in the oil and gas drilling space. And next week, you see, you see the Gusta Messi NG 14,000 XL. NG stands for next generation. 14,000 is the, is, the, is the weight in tons that we can apply on each leg as we drive them into the ground during pre-driving to, to actually have the stable foundation. XL is, is the, because it's extra large. And the vessel you see on the, the vessel, the jacket, the CJ drilling jacket you see on the picture is the, not, is the no, Noble Light Noble. And on the installation side, you see the CJAC Scylla. And the Scylla is a 14,000, the Dominion vessel 16,000. So the Dominion vessel is even bigger. And two things that jumps out, jump out to you, first is deck space, right? We're looking at football field size here. You know, the, the deck, the net deck area of the Dominion vessel will be the size of a football field. And you also, so I, I have the Texans, our in, in GR stadium there for comparison of football field being at about 5,300 meters square. And, you know, the, the envelope area of the NG14,000 is actually 7,100. 7, now, the net space is, is a bit smaller, but you can, you can get the, the, you know, the size of the things, right? And also the amount of load that you are, you're able to apply on those legs, right? On, on CJ rig, you, might, you, you can apply up to 20,000 tons per leg. And on the 14,000, 14,000 tons on the Dominion vessel, 16,000 tons. As a comparison, the Eiffel Tower complete, it's 10,000 tons. So you're actually applying, you know, two Eiffel Towers in each of those legs of the CJ-70 and about one and a half Eiffel Tower in each leg of, a, of an installation vessel. That's a lot of load. Mm. And also have a, as a comparison, the thrust of the Saturn V rocket that took, you know, Took the man um, took man to the moon, right? Was something like thirty five hundred tons. I mean, that's the magnitude of loads that those legs are designed for. And, and in the and you just don't do that once, right? Uh, particularly the wind turbine installation vessels are designed for doing that one hundred and fifty times a year. You know, a drilling rig is usually designed for less than ten, and, and the more modern rigs may be on on, on a site for over a year. But but those these, the, the installation vessels are there to are designed to actually move 150 times a year and repeat this operation 150 times a year. So, oh, wow. in, in a way, it's like launching a rocket 150 times a year in terms of applying loads on those legs. So the design of those legs, the jacking system, the leg to interface connection. I mean, it's a lot of very sound engineering. Right. 
right. and that's where Gusta Messi exceeds. I mean, the first North Sea Jacob was a Gusta Messi design, was the seashell. So there are decades of experience in in getting to a, to the systems that work as fast as they need to work, and to have all those moves and installations. Mm -hmm. So if you're just joining us, we are talking with our, our guest, Alberto Morandi. He is the Houston general manager for Gusto MSC uh, here at NOV. And we are talking about offshore wind installation vessels, uh, the technology that the team is able to provide. And of course, as always, taking any of your questions that you might have for our, our guest, Alberto. So if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the uh, comment section, whether you're watching us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, and uh, we'll be sure to try to get to as many questions as we can. Also, uh, if you have a, a question that maybe is a little more detailed, again, you can always send us an email, and that's gonna be at socialmedia at nov.com. So we're always happy to take your questions and, uh, and see if we can't get those answered for you. So uh, turning back over to you, Alberto, uh, you know, I know that, uh, and we've, we've mentioned it, I think you mentioned it briefly earlier, uh, that there was uh, a news, uh, actually it was a, a virtual press conference, of course, sign of the times, right? Not, not in person, but That's a virtual right. press conference um, with uh, Dominion uh, using the Gusto MSC design for a jackup uh, installation vessel. So could you talk a little bit more about uh, about that collaboration and if there are others like it? Because I know leveraging the expertise and, and skill set of the team is, is really helping make an impact in the industry. Right, and, and, and you know, just stepping back, the, the, the supply chain for offshore wind in the US is, is under development, right? And I think that the installation vessel is great news. There are other service vessels being announced. We need developments on import infrastructure. We're gonna need to have the fabrication of monopiles, all of that is evolving very quickly, right? And, and Augusta Messi, we've been looking at this US offshore market for over 10 years now, right? And we, in 2016, 2017, we actually participated in a study for the New York State Research Ag Agency, NYSERDA, which developed a roadmap for the interstate cooperation in the East Coast for offshore wind. And in that study, we we clearly saw that, that, that we're going to need a number of vessels, right? And it's great news that Dominion is taking, is taking this great, this first step. And, you know, we did some initial work for some years now with CJAX, we will operate and partly on the vessels. We also have a long collaboration with, with CJAX, you know, the CILA is our design too. And we very quickly realized that working with the shipyards was critical because those vessels, in order to go into port, they need to be Jones Act compliant. Therefore, they need to build in the US so that difference between the cost of building the US and building, let's say, in Southeast Asia was very important to bridge. And 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 Capital Umfeld's emergence, emerged as really the successful shipyard that really invested time and, and, and effort into also making this project happen. And we also have a very long history of cooperation with Capital Umfeld's and then Dominion came in as, as the main investor and, and they're building a vessel that not just for their project, but for the offshore wind industry in the US, right? They are the front runners. So the cooperation with Dominion, CJAX, Capital Umfels and Gusta Messi was fantastic. And it is a, great, it is a very important step to you know, solidify this supply chain in the US. Wow, that's really good. Yeah. And, and and I'd like to maybe dive in a little bit. Again, I recognize that, um, you know, there there are many markets that continue to drive forward with uh, offshore wind installation farms and, and so forth. I know uh, specifically here in the U.S., it's it's more of a an emerging space. Um, so I, I maybe just kind of wanted to get a, maybe just a little more perspective uh, here and kind of zoom in. So for the the U.S. market. Uh, can you talk about kind of what the the next major steps are that uh, that it looks like the the industry is taking in that in that regard? Yeah, I mean, we, I I still believe we're going to see more vessels to, for wind farm installation. You, you know, the the the, the medium vessel is, is what we call a full solution is a wind turbine installation vessel. We can call into port. You can transport the components. You can lift 
wind, wind turbine components and foundations and, and, and do the entire cycle, right? Which then eliminates a lot of the offshore handshakes and, 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 and really optimizes downtime. There's also a, a, a concept called feedering, where you actually have a Jones Act vessel that is only going to port and feeding the components to a perhaps a, a foreign flag vessel that only does the installation, and that will be allowed by the Jones Act. So the feedering concept is one where we are also working very hard, and we have basically a jack-up concept, but we also have a, a, an interesting concept that's a floating vessel, which is a, we call the steady top feeder vessel. It's a floating vessel with a motion compensation at the deck level. And we believe that also can be a very effective feedering solution. And, you know, I think that's kind of the next step is, is what, what's gonna be the next build. I think there will be a next build in, in, the, in the US, maybe another W2IV, maybe a feedering solution. So I think that's mm. where I see. Okay, great. So, uh, so, so for those uh, solutions and and specifically some of the the concepts that we've been been talking about, I know uh, you know folks are always wanting to know, like, okay, you know, what's what's commercialized now and and what's available, um, you know, as they kind of think through some some opportunities and uh, and and expanding the the market. So, could you kind of talk about that? You know, what what is uh, is available uh, that we've discussed so far? Yeah, and, you know, our both WTIV and feeder solutions are there, available, ready. You you know, I the Dominion cut steel last uh, uh, couple of Anfels cut steel on the Dominion vessel last year. The Shimizu vessel is also under construction, and that one actually has a a, a telescopic crane that developed by Gustav and CNOV. And I think we have a lot of excitement around the telescopic crane. So. You know, these are really market ready solutions. You know, I think I, I always say there's a lot of what I call LinkedIn engineering. People create some really nice graphics, but maybe with not enough engineering background and, and, and our policy in Gustav SC is purpose of purposeful innovation is to innovate something that will help our clients with their problems. And you know that fits into very well with the NOV culture, right? We that we like to we like to go to the market with products that have a lot of solid engineering behind. They're ready to deliver what we we commit to our clients. Mm. So yeah. I think you know our vessel designs, our jacking systems, and our cranes are products that are there for the market. And you know we look forward to help. Great. Well, uh, we we appreciate that and know yeah. Uh, had the opportunity to talk, of course, with you and many of uh, the colleagues in in Skidam in uh, in uh, the Netherlands, and know that yeah, there's a whole whole team that is constantly uh, working to deliver on that. So we appreciate it. Uh, of course, one thing we want to deliver on is answering the questions that were put into uh, the comment section while we were having our conversation. So if you have been holding on to a question, it's not too late. You can go ahead and put that in uh, the comments section now, but uh, Shelby, we'll go ahead and get you uh, going and see if we can't get some of those questions uh, answered uh, by Alberto. Absolutely, yeah, we had some great ones already, but certainly, like you said, Michael, um, if you're watching and you have more, you still have a chance, go ahead and type them in and we're gonna get to as many as we can. Uh, so this first question, Alberto, came from Larry on LinkedIn, and he was wanting to know, um, what opportunities are, or is, are there more opportunities for offshore um, oil uh, workers to join in on this, you know, the, the up and coming wind and, uh, you know, wind turbine installation vessels, that kind of work. Is there opportunity for crossover from oil and gas to, to wind? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm very passionate about the subject. I, I wrote an article for, I'm a member of SNAMI Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, I think. The naval architects are very active in that because there's a lot of commonality, and and I think, you know, I I like I like to say that the main technologies when you look at jackups and we look at spars and you look at semi subs, so many of those were created by oil and gas, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm really excited to see how much this talent for oil and gas migrate into offshore wind. How much we're going to be able to contribute? Because well, I'm one of them, of course. You know how much 
th this town is going to be able to contribute to develop commercial solutions for offshore wind and, and, and renewable energy in general. You know, I think there's I at least at least hope that there's a space for everybody in this energy transition. And you know, I you know, a subject for another day, things like carbon capture might be a great opportunity for all those who have made a career of getting a hydrocarbons off the ground to put them back, you know. So I think I encourage everyone to look for opportunities and you know because I think there will be a transition and, and oil and gas talent will be a part of it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that's a good point too. We talk a lot on this show, but also a lot on Inside Out with the Saad Mahana about energy transition yeah. and how it will be kind of a, a gradual, you know, it's, it's not like it's saying goodbye to, to some people and hello to others. It's, it's going to no, be I mean, emerging for sure. I think that there's this special kind of talent, which is that make things happen talent, right? And, and, and the oil and gas business off, and the offshore business, which are no more attracted a lot of this type of individual who, you know, dream up ideas and make them happen. And I think that this type of individuals are needed in the renewable energy space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so we have another question. This one also comes from LinkedIn. Uh, what would the average crew size be to run a single installation with one of these vessels? So. Um, they they mentioned this could be personnel and support ships, but of approximately yeah. the size of that crew. Yeah, the, there's a, they're designed for a hundred, around 130, 150. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. And then, so we got another. And, 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 and being Jones Act, they'll be crewed by U.S. seamen. Right. Uh, so this next question we have. Um, and, th and this is they did say what what does alberto believe so feel free if, if this is a you can speak more to opinion or um answer it how, you, how you'd like to but what does alberto say what do you believe um is the biggest issue to getting offshore u.s installations to increase in either the atlantic pacific or uh, even gulf of mexico i think the biggest issue so far has been the the permitting process it's mm -hmm. very low you know it's very complex of course you have to take a step back, right? When oil and gas started, we, you know, it was a different planet, different, you know, less populated. You know, there was not as much environmental awareness as today. Now we inserting, we are inserting a trillion dollar industry into communities that exist. So there's concerns over, over fishermen, over, you know, visual impact and all that. But you know, I think the new administration could have a very real impact in the short term if they could really streamline the permitting process for those projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so this next question um, comes from Syed on LinkedIn, and he's wondering, are cable laying and offshore substations part of the scope for wind turbine installation vessels? No, they're not. No, they're, they are specialist cable layer and installation vessel. Mm -hmm. It's also a very interesting area. I haven't been directly exposed. I've followed it, but you know, I understand those cables. You know, the the, the cable is the pipeline of the of the wind, right? Like we have the pipeline in oil and gas. The cable is what is going to move the product in a way. And understanding it, 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 the cable has like a two year lead time, so it's a really long lead component and very important. And there are some really interesting vessels being built to to accelerate cable laying, but it's not the jack up installation vessel. All right, wow, those are some good questions. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, have, wouldn't have thought of that one. So that's one of the reasons we always enjoy having these conversations and uh, and really uh, picking your brain there on, uh, on having technical experts share their insight and perspective. So really appreciate uh, the time today. So for those that, joined in. We uh, were speaking with Alberto Morandi. He's the Houston general manager for Gusto MSC. And we were talking about um, offshore wind installation vessels and the uh, the market they're in. So uh, Alberto sounds like a really exciting uh, place to, to really focus in on and, and certainly appreciate you lending your expertise and sharing that with our viewers today. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for all those who, who listened to us. And all right. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. And yeah, we uh, certainly want to don't want to leave uh, folks hanging who uh, joined in our 
uh, Rigig Post of the Week question earlier. So uh, we'll uh, cap it off with Shelby giving us the answer to today's question. So uh, for those those that like the 30 second challenge, <laughs> Shelby, what, what was the question uh, for today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've talked a, a lot about the Dominion uh, vessel being built. And so we asked what um, what the name of the vessel was based on a Greek mythological sea monster. And uh, so, I'll, you know, drum roll. Okay. I saw a lot of really great guesses in the comments I wanted to say. Um, I loved Kraken. I wanted to give a, a special shout out to uh, the Little Mermaid, which I think would be an excellent name <laughs> for a wind turbine <laughs> installation vessel. Um, but the correct answer was Charybdis. Uh, so there it is on screen. Yep, Charybdis uh, from Greek mytho mytho mythology, uh, kind of a, a, a whirlpool type sea monster. So thank you for everyone for, for tuning in, for get, putting your guesses in for Rig Geeks. And uh, I like to see... I, I like to see every week what our what our rig geeks get, but uh, so I look forward to the next question as well. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Shelby. Really appreciate uh, that. And uh, again, as always, appreciate you tuning in to NOV Live. Uh, you can catch us here every Wednesday at eleven o'clock uh, U.S. Central Time. So, of course, on beha behalf of all of us here at NOV, thanks for watching and for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.